Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Philippe Silva. Uh, I work on the CLI team. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, you might have seen me around the CLI uh, issue tracker as the person that initiates pretty much any interaction with the word Heya. Um, so that's me. A bit less hair, but you know. Um, and today I'm here to talk about the state of the CLI, uh, kind of like give you an overview of what we expect. Uh, sometimes what we're working on and what we're, we want to do next is, is not very clear. Um, and I want to shed some light. We just released CLI v7. Um, and the main feature that you can probably see in CLI v7 is prompts. If you have a, a terminal that's a TTY terminal, you can, when you do ngnu, without putting in a project name, it'll ask you a couple of questions. We think this is a useful feature, and I'll expand on it a bit later. Um, the other thing that we did is to only re load the reflect polyfill on JIT builds. This is nice because only JIT builds actually need this reflect polyfill in most circumstances, and that shaves up about 20 kilobytes of your production bundle. Uh, then we put the docs on Angular I.O. This has been a bit of a pain point. Uh, our documentation has traditionally built been on the CLI repo inside the wiki. It's not very clear that it's there. People go to AngularIO and they want to know what these commands do. Uh, they can now know this. We'll be migrating more and more documentation there, but for now, the commands are there. Uh, we've had a, a, a flag to the builds. You can actually profile the builds, and this is useful when like, you update the CLI and you find, oh, the, like, my build is taking twice as long. Something's wrong. Um, this usually leads to issues being filed on the issue tracker and some back and forth, and I'm trying to tell people this is, this is how you can take profiles. So we added a, uh, a flag to make it easier for you to profile your build and send it over to us so we can look into it. Some, sometimes these performance problems are really hard to diagnose and are very, very project specific. Um, this, this, last, this bit is a bit of a milestone for us. The CLI is now used inside Google. It wasn't before. But now, uh, users of Angular inside Google and outside are also doing ngnu, ngbuild, and all of that. Uh, I'll get back to why we want to do this a bit later. And we actually think that the CLI is stable. That's why you don't, you don't see any revolution, revolutionary features here. So uh, contrary to what Bonnie was thinking, maybe, maybe we're not actually adding a lot of new stuff to the CLI. Um, we actually think that. Well, initially, the CLI was meant to, to exist as a single thing, which is we want to make, for the majority of use cases, making an Angular app easy to create, build, maintain, and in overall interact with. And I think that for the majority of use cases, this is true right now. There are some exceptions. Um, what we make and what we put, make available as default doesn't actually suit all projects. Sometimes the CLI is just perfect, except for this one small thing. Um, and truth is, we don't want to add flags for each small thing that comes along. We want to actually allow you to do that customization via advanced APIs. One such API is schematics. Um, the CLI is actually a collection of tools. There's The CLI started as a, a single big tool, and then we started separating everything that we could separate. And one of the ones that's well separated and that's, that exists on its own right now is Schematics. Uh, we've just released Schematics v7. Uh, schematics is actually what internally powers ngnu, ng-generate, update, and add. Oh. Uh, schematics standalone is also used inside of Google now. And this is the first major release of Schematics. Uh, sch before v7, Schematics was 0 0.7, and since we like skipping versions a lot. We just make a v made a v7, so everything's coordinated. Uh, but this has a couple of implications. We, we feel now it's stable. At 0.x, it wasn't stable. Uh, it, a lot of people saw the 0.x and thought, this is still experimental. I, I don't want to dip my feet into the water right now, because maybe things will change. We're kind of committed to it not changing now. We're committed to, to making it a stable thing that you can rely on in production, and that you can feel confident going forward with. And as I mentioned before, we have prompts. And prompts are actually managed by schematics. I'll give you an example of a prompt that we have today. Uh, this is the prompt, how, how the prompt looks for adding material. And it asks you a couple of basic questions. What's the theme that you want? Do you want to add animations? Do you want to add gesture support? It's, it's, these questions by themselves aren't, don't look very important. But on the context of initial experience, 
they are very important. This is essentially the getting started part of Angular Material. This is something that if you were doing by hand, making these decisions and copying over the code and adding the fonts, etc., I will say that it will take you roughly 20 minutes to 30 minutes, which, like me saying that getting for getting started takes that long sounds weird, but consider how long it takes to actually look up these new terms as a new user, how long it takes to actually validate that what you're doing is correct, how long it takes to backtrack when something goes wrong. So that can end up taking a while. And when you just want to try out a new idea, when you just want to, you know, you've thought of something on a Saturday afternoon and you have like two hours where you want to play with it, that the setup takes perhaps one or two minutes instead of 30 minutes is kind of substantial. You just have more time to, to play with what you want to play. Yeah. Um, so what we want to do right now for schematics is to focus on documentation and support. We want to make it easy to use schematics. Uh, our documentation now is not great for schematics. You'll find a lot of blog posts. You'll find a lot of community uh, posts telling how you do this and that. We want to make good first-party documentation for schematics. We want to make it easier for you to create the things that you want to create with schematics and to plug into the CLI using schematics. And the big thing that we're looking for, uh, looking at working at now, is large workspaces. Um, you've probably actually been to a couple of talks where large workspaces or uh, taking care of building monorepos has been a central topic. We think it's a very important topic. We think that the CLI right now does not do that well. Uh, by large workspaces, we mean either one single huge project uh, in which the big problems are something like builds take very long time, or very small projects in which the problems are actually coordinating all of that and managing these projects and making sure everything works the way you want it to. It's important to notice that a big project is not just a small project with a lot more files, uh, in the same way that a skyscraper is not just a tall house. Uh, there is a difference in kind. The support structure you need to actually make these things work and make your team be able to coordinate with, with each other and make all of, these thing, all of these individual projects work together properly is different than on small projects where maybe it's just one or two. And the way that we're trying to address that is by adding, adding opt-in Bazel support. Um, you might have heard the word Bazel a couple of times throughout this conference or maybe other Angular conferences. Bazel is a tool that's used internally at Google. Uh, they use it to coordinate most of what's built at Google. Uh, we want to add this feature as a part of labs. This means that it's very much experimental for now, but as time goes by, it gets more mature, and eventually we release it with full support and full guarantees of stability. Bazel exists as a build coordinator in the context of CLI mostly. This means that it's not that we want to replace, for instance, Webpack, which is what we use behind the hood for builds right now with Bazel, but rather that we want to use Bazel to coordinate a multitude of builds. Maybe we want to coordinate Webpack builds. Maybe we want to coordinate Karma runs. But we want something to be coordinating all of that. And I've been talking a bit about how like the CLI is used at Google, schematics is used at Google, and now I'm mentioning something that's used at Google and that we want to put it in the CLI. Um, the reason why I'm, I'm saying that is because at the, at the CLI team, at the tools team, we actually have this vision that we have a confluence of tools. We want to bring the tools that are used inside of Google outside and the tools that are being used outside of Google inside of Google. Um, and bringing Bazel into the CLI is a big part of that. And I want to emphasize that even if you opt into this large workspace support mode, you're still using the CLI. You still do ng build, you still do ng test, ng lint, all of that. Your interaction patterns shouldn't change. Uh, that's, that's kind of why that was part of the original mission of the CLI, that you had this toolkit in which you could do all of these things that perhaps before you did it scripts or you did with multiple commands, et cetera. We wanted to give you a good interface that you just did one command. And we'd like to do something similar for large workspaces, too. So let's talk about how it should look like in the future. Um, I mentioned that the API into hooking into schematics, uh, sorry, the API into looking into the CLI using schematics should allow you some customization. So we're going to use our own customization here. Uh, we'd say that we want to globally install at Angular slash Bazel. And that when we make a new project, we want to use a specific collection, which is the one at, at Angular slash Bazel. Uh, 
this should make a new project using Bazel. This should be coming in 7.x, so it's not here today. If you try to do this today, well, nothing good can happen. Uh, but eventually, this, this is how we plan for it to look like. But if you have an existing project, you can also convert your project. So in, in the example of adding Angular material, what happened is that when you add Angular material, a bunch of your files are changed. Uh, so we try to do that work for you. For instance, we add the styles, we add configuration to Angular.json, we add the animations module, we add in, any imports needed, we do all of that. So when adding Bazel, we'd be aiming at doing the same thing. Any configuration in any files that need, would need to be changed, we'd do that for you so that you could add it and then keep on working as you were working roughly before. And I want to say that I mentioned we wanted to add Bazel to support large workspaces. But there's also benefits in small workspaces. Uh, there's good things about Bazel that you can see even if you opt to use Bazel from the start. One of those benefits is hermeticity. Uh, and this is one that's kind of dear to me. It, I think it's very common that sometimes your project works on your machine and doesn't work on other machines. That's because generally your project depends on stuff that's not just on the project. The most obvious is that it depends on Node. It depends on the Node version that you're using. And it will depend on your package manager, NPM or Yarn. And then when your colleagues have a different version of these things and you run your project on their machine, something different might happen. Maybe the build won't be what won't finish successfully. Maybe you'll see a couple of errors that you didn't see on your machine. But it, almost all projects depend on it a little bit more than that. For instance, if you run your tests locally and you try to run them on, the, on your continuous integration machine, maybe that won't work very well. That's because locally you depend on your local Chrome. And on the CI, maybe Chrome isn't installed. So this hermeticity is actually guaranteed by Bazel. You can have a very strong guarantee that if it's running on your machine, it should run on other machines because Bazel codifies everything that your build actually needs. And hand with, to hand with this is that you actually don't have to set up your environment. Uh, if, if we're downloading packages for NPM, we might have to use NPM, but Bazel will actually install packages separately so that whenever something is running, even if you, if you, even if you forgot to install your your packages, maybe it will still run because Bazel will just install everything in the background and it will guarantee that everyone that's running this project will be using the same thing. Uh, another thing is that you can debug intermediate files. I expect that a lot of people here have had cryptic errors on ng factories. And on the CLI, if you see an error on an ng factory, you're kind of out of luck because you, the ng factory isn't anywhere. Um, so you can't debug these things. Things that are left in as intermediate steps or, for instance, files before uglification, you just can't see what's there. But since Bazel actually leaves the intermediate steps around, you'd be able to see them. When we go up to medium-sized workspaces, uh, you start to see a couple more benefits. Build coordination, I think, is really the big one. Um, for instance, if you have one application and one library right now, you have to remember to build the library before you build your application. Uh, and if you forget to build it, then your application won't succeed its build. But in your mind, you, you know, I need to build the library before. Why, why didn't the build system do this for me? But stuff actually gets a bit more complicated when you have several of these. For instance, if you have libraries that depend on one another or applications that depend on multiple libraries, and as this, this dependency graph increases, it's completely impossible to right now just remember to do everything by hand. It's very cumbersome. And this is the main way by which I think Angular integrates really well with the CLI, right? Uh, that Bazel integrates really well with the CLI right now. Um, and since it's actually building this, this graph of what it needs to, to coordinate and build, it will be parallel by default. It knows what's on the critical path, what's not, and everything that can run in parallel. You might say that uh, Node does this. Node is single-threaded by default, but you can run things in parallel and spawn other processes. But in Bazel, that just, that's just the norm. Now, in medium workspaces, we also have something called incrementality. Uh, you might have seen other talks talk about incrementality, especially in the last year, I believe, which is the idea that 
the time it takes to effect the change should be proportional to the change, not to the size of the whole project. So for instance, if you're just changing a little part of your library and your application depends on your library, it's reasonable enough to imagine that both need to be rebuilt. But if you're just changing your application, maybe your library doesn't need to be rebuilt. Or even within your application, if you've just changed the global styles, then why do you actually need to rebuild everything the next time you build? So Bazel can figure out what actually needs to be rebuilt and not just rebuild everything. And another very good thing is that Bazel will cache all builds and tests. It's kind of easy to underestimate how important this is, but as your project grows, you're no longer looking at testing maybe taking one or two minutes. When tests are taking 10 minutes, you start having to adopt certain strategies. Maybe you isolate this, this test that's going to run. Uh, maybe you actually try not to run most tests unless you really have to. And that, that becomes hard to manage. Uh, with Bazel, you can have this guarantee that only the tests that need to be rerun are actually run. So it's, it's very similar to the build example, that if your library changes, maybe the, it needs to be retested and your application needs to be retested. But surely, if your application changes, your library doesn't depend on your application. The library tests don't need to be run again. And when you start getting to large workspaces, the situation gets even better. Uh, the same cache that you can have locally, you can have remotely. What this means in a lot of cases is that however fast things are on your machine, they can also be on your CI. Because you can have like this, this huge library of cached builds, and your CI just connects to them, and everything that was already cached, it doesn't need to build again. But besides just caching the builds themselves remotely, you can also run them remotely. Um, and this is really a problem on big projects. If your build takes about one hour with your amount of cores, let's be generous and say 16, I don't think it'll take one hour if you have like a thousand cores available. I think a lot of things become really fast when you have a thousand cores available. And when you get these two things together, you have something even better, which is no build needs to be run more than once if, if it hasn't actually changed. So imagine that you get to the office uh, Tuesday morning, someone made huge changes Monday afternoon. The first time that someone actually orders a build, everything will be cached. The second person will get the cached results. So these builds don't actually need to be rerun. Something that would take one hour per team member suddenly doesn't. It takes like one hour and maybe like a couple of minutes for the others to fetch the results. And something that also happens as projects grow is that they start using more than one language um, and more than one build system. If you have a library right now, it might not be apparent, but the build system for your library is not the same as the build system for your application. They're slightly different. They support slightly different things. Uh, but going forward, if you have, for instance, a server, maybe your server is not actually written in JavaScript, maybe it's written in Go. And having multiple languages being built on the same workspace, is, is, it's not trivial. Uh, you have to have like different build setups for each of them, and you have to coordinate uh, building of different languages. And actually, Bazel is really good at that. It, it doesn't really care what it's, what it's building as long as it's shown how to build it. The last thing is, I, I think most will think rather minor, but for me, as, as someone that spends a lot of time in tooling, is, is actually rather major. Um, being able to debug directly in the source. Sometimes you have to pull in other projects, and this, this happens a lot in the NPM ecosystem, that their repositories are, for instance, in TypeScript. So their project needs to be built before you can actually choose a change that you need there. So for instance, imagine that your server is bugged and you actually have a, uh, a, a server in some other repository. Uh, in projects that use Bazel, you can make, make dependencies to, directly to the source. So you can make dependencies to sources that you control and also if they also use Bazel sources that you don't control. And then their whole build system is again codified. You don't need to set up any environment. You don't need to do anything else. You can just go directly into, your, into their source, make some kind of change, and see how that affects your project. And that's, that's really hard to do with pretty much anything outside Bazel. Anyone that has tried to compile an NPM package that needs any kind of build step or is even a mono repo and then bring the results over to yours, you probably had some difficulties doing that. 
So although I said that this doesn't exist yet, we do have a demo. It's a very experimental demo. This demo has two labs icons to show that it's extra experimental, but it's kind of like twice experimental. It's, you, but you can try it right now. It will more work mostly on Windows. So for instance, I think that the normal serve doesn't work, but the production serve does work, and it will fully work on both OS X and Linux. Uh, so this is something that you can go check out right now. You just clone the repository, get into the folder, run yarn, and then run ng-serve, and something will come up. And this is a good example. The same commands were used, but the build system, what's underneath, was different, and things were coordinated in a different way. Uh, so I encourage you to go test this. I don't really encourage you to submit issues because it's, again, very experimental. If it doesn't work on your setup, we really want it to work, uh, but it's something that we're going to be iterating a lot, a lot uh, over the next months. And I finished a bit earlier. Um, I hope that you have you know, some more time to talk to each other and, uh, and enjoy the space. But thank you for coming and thank you for listening to this talk. <laughs>